Now, I must admit that uh, I didn't realize how difficult this subject would be because there's a lot of information, okay, in the Bible. And, uh, but also just um, people use of Scripture. And, uh, and, and let me just start there. The Bible talks a, a great deal about God and wealth and prosperity and riches. And I just want to start out just looking at some verses. Just with, and, and these are, don't have any particular order to them, but primarily for, for, for some of the statements that they make. But because there's, there's this amount of information in the scripture that talks about God and talks about riches and talks about wealth, that those two things are tied together, God and wealth, God and prosperity, and especially some of the types of statements that are made that uh, people like the word of faith, you know, Pentecostalism comes along and take those statements and make things out of those statements that are not sound doctrine, okay? So let's start, let's, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 17 through 18. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 17 and 18. Now, this is a passage of Scripture where God is speaking to Israel. And um, verse 17, it says, And thou say in thine heart, Israel would say in thine heart, My power and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he sware to unto thy fathers, as it is this day. Um, some of these verses, uh, and especially as I start seeing them, I might be tempted to talk about some of them, but one of the things you have to guard against is you have very limited time. And I got a lot of verses to look at, so I'm not going to try to comment on them. But this is one of the verses that uh, the Word of Faith movement like to use. They like to talk about the fact that God says, it is he that giveth the power to get wealth that he may have. But they don't, you know, they don't always continue the verse. They just like to select that phrase about the power to get wealth, that God gives the power to get wealth. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 19. Ecclesiastes. Chapter 5 and verse 19. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. But just the, 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 the fact that the scripture speaks of God giving riches, and wealth. Again, the Bible talks a lot about God and wealth and prosperity and riches. First Chronicles 29 and verse 12. First Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 12. Let's start at verse 11. No, let's start at verse 10. <laughs> Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation, and David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness 
and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord. And thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee. And thou reignest over all, and in thine hand is power and might. And in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now a lot of these verses you, you will see are in the context of God's relationship to the nation of Israel. Look at Proverbs chapter 20, 22 and verse 4. Proverbs chapter 22. In verse 4, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Now, you can go, I can continue that, but I'm, like I said, I'm going to move on. But again, the, the idea is that you're seeing most of these verses is that God has given riches and wealth and honor and life. God maketh Poor, God maketh rich. He bringeth low, he lifteth up. Uh, the Lord is the maker of them all, the scripture says. Um, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, it says in one place, and he addeth no sorrow with it. Now, in Acts chapter 14, in verse 16, we read over there about how God had suffered all nations, allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. And it says, yet he left himself not without witness in that he did good. He gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And as I look at that, uh, it is because of the providence of God that all men can prosper in this world. Um, a number of the messages I've heard, and I couldn't remember uh, who said what at this point. <laughs> but one of the ideas that I, I, I heard in several of the messages is just that which is common to life, that which is common to, to all men. It, it's not so much God as in the case of the nation of Israel. Divinely blessing them in, in, in a special way. In a miraculous way. But yet there, there, there is that all men prosper, can prosper. Let me say it that way. And it's because of the providence of God and his provision for his creation. Again, verse 17, nevertheless, he left not himself <clears throat> without witness in that he did good. And he gave, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful season, filling our hearts with food and gladness. But because of the providence of God, because of the fact that all men can prosper, it is that prosperity is not delivered on a silver platter. Now, this is where you get into the question, you know, the ideas of principles, biblical principles. You hear people begin to talk about biblical principle, applying biblical principles uh, to life. Now, generally, when we talk about biblical principle, applying biblical principles, we're generally talking about among believers. You know, people who believe in God and taking and looking to God to give them instructions about how to prosper how to succeed, how to be successful in life. And, and my point is, you can, again, you have a lot of that in the scriptures. You have a lot of in, uh, statements about prosperity, about wealth and so forth. Get Psalm 73 uh, and verse um, 12. 
12. Psalm 73 and verse 12. Now, this whole psalm is an interesting psalm um, because one of the things it talks about is the wicked, the ungodly. And it's talking about a godly man, in this case a godly Jew, looking out there at the ungodly, at the prosperity of the wicked. That's back in 73 and verse 3. But in verse 12 it says, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. And so I just simply make the point that you have a lot said about God and about wealth and about prosperity and riches. And a lot of that a lot of those verses, many a times, is speaking of it from, from the perspective of the providence of God in providing. And again, you're familiar with the, 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 the saying about sowing and reaping. Just, again, different kinds of principles that aren't just limited, so to speak, to, to the godly. That these are things that are just, would be the common exercise that whether you are saved or unsaved, whether you're godly or ungodly, if you apply those principles, you would reap the, the benefits, especially if they are designed to, again, like sowing and reaping. You plant a seed, you get a harvest. And uh, lost people plant, they, they, they farm, they harvest, and so forth. And uh, they prosper. But that's the, gen- that's the general providence of God, providing for creation. But again, it's not just handed to you on a civil platter. Uh, you know, the, 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 the saying, you don't work, you don't eat. <laughs> and you got a lot of verses in there about, you know, idleness and so forth in Scripture. Now, I want you to look at um, Luke chapter 6. In verse 38, now it's because of all of these different statements in the Bible on God and riches and wealth and prosperity. There are some other kinds of statements that are made here that I want to take a quick look at with you. That I would say give rise to the subject or the question, is there a Bible wealth code? And when you're talking about a Bible wealth code, basically what that is is you're talking about scriptural principles for getting wealth. And if you, again, just to take note of the verses that we've already talked about, you know, one might think that there is such a code in the Bible for getting wealth. Um... But look at Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 and um, verse 38. Here's one of the favorite verses of the Word of Faith, the Pentecost, the health, wealth, prosperity crowd. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom for the same measure that ye meet with with all, it shall be measured to you again. Now, I I, I will say again that many of these verses like this are generally associated with the nation of Israel. You don't want to miss that, miss that fact. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Now these again, these are just verses that I I believe that the the whole notion or the whole idea of a Bible wealth code uh, tends to um, develop out of. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 
verses 6 through 8. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Now generally, the, 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 you know, if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. You, that taken in conjunction with a, a verse like Luke 6.38 again, is used to teach something I don't believe the scriptures are teaching. But when, when you, you talk about um, a Bible wealth code, when you talk about um, scriptural principles for getting well, these are the kinds of things, these are the kinds of verses that are often referred to and often made use of. Look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 7 through 12. Malachi chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. Malachi chapter 3, verse 7. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances. And have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offering. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Again, take note of the fact that these verses that are oftentimes made use of to emphasize, uh, again, scriptural principles, divine principle or, or Bible code for for getting wealth, that generally these verses are associated with God's covenant people, the nation of Israel. Look at Matthew chapter 19, verse 28 and 29. Matthew 19, verse 28 and 29. Now, and you can get also Luke chapter 18, 29 and 30. Now, in Matthew 19, 28 and 29, um, Well, let's, st- let's start at verse 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And, and let me say, uh, about the word of faith movement, about prosperity, preaching and teaching and, and those things, they're speaking of those things as being uh, acquired in this life. Uh, as... as as if God has made the promise or the commitment to create wealth and prosperity and health for his people now. Now, whether you're talking about Israel or whether you're talking about uh, 
believers today in the dispensation of grace, uh, generally when people are talking about those things, they're looking at those things as, as acquiring wealth or acquiring pro- having prosperity, having health now. They, they see God as offering those things to be obtained now. And here in, in, in Matthew 19... When I, when I hear these guys, you know, most of these guys are promoting the kingdom program rather than the mystery program or the grace program. But I think it's a mistake to think that they're even reading or interpreting the kingdom program properly or, or even using those scriptures in the right way. They're, I don't believe they are. In Matthew 19, verses 27 through 29, I think is one of the passages, and we'll look at a couple of other verses in this regard, that I think proves and demonstrates that. It might be well for me to say, say here, I think it may come up in my notes here a little, little later. But when we're, when we're thinking or looking at this subject, like any other doctrine, like any other teaching of Scripture, you have to rightly divide the word of truth. And because your Bible is, the, you know, the two most important divisions in your Bible is between prophecy and the mystery, uh, revolving around the nation of Israel, and revolving around the church, which is the body of Christ, that you have to, to look at this subject of, of prosperity and wealth or these statements as to, you have to look at it dispensationally. You, you have, um, for example, Israel's history in Acts 7.38, you, the Bible speaks of the church which in the wilderness and the law that God gave that nation, that governs that nation, instructed that nation on how to walk so as to please God. And the law would have had much to teach and to say to the nation of Israel about wealth and prosperity, what God's uh, policy was with, with regards to, to the nation at that time. Then we come to the kingdom messianic church that began to be called out, separate, called out around the preaching uh, that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God, which commenced with the ministry of John the Baptist. And that kingdom messianic church, the Sermon on the Mount, the gospel of the kingdom, be- was the the doctrine uh, that set forth the instructions to govern this new community of believers, the, the, the true Israel of God. God was separating out from amongst the apostate nation um, that little flock, that little flock of believers. And God had, and the Lord taught the Sermon on the Mount, the Gospel of the Kingdom, and, and, and we'll see here in, in much of Jesus' teaching about riches and wealth takes on a different understanding in the Gospels than, they did, than it did when, with Israel in the wilderness or, you know, from uh, the church in the wilderness and, and the law. Let me say it this way. Luke sixteen sixteen, the law and the prophets were until John. So until John, the, the, the instructions, the teachings about riches and wealth was somewhat, I would say, fundamentally radically different commencing with the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. And here, for example, uh, in fact, the, 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 the teaching of the gospel of the kingdom, the teachings of Christ, during his earthly ministry, um, did not 
instruct or indicate or suggest in any way that anyone should be pursuing wealth, should be pursuing riches as such. In fact, the teaching was just the opposite because one of, one of the principles of the gospel, uh, the teachings of the gospel of the kingdom was to sell all that you had. So it would be kind of a contradiction on the one hand to, to believe in the, and to teach that God wanted you to be rich and wealthy while at the same time teaching you to sell all that you have and to give alms. So here in Matthew 19, beginning at verse 27, then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. And why did they forsake all? Because that was the instructions. That was the requirement. If you remember the rich young ruler that approached the Lord and said, My good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Christ says, Keep the commandments. And he says, I've done that from my youth up. What lack I yet? If thou will be perfect then, go and sell all that you have and come and follow me. And you can imagine this being a rich man. Imagine what his demeanor was at that point. So here in Matthew 19, verse 27, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have? Therefore, in fact, let's look back up at verse 13. Uh, 23, not 13, verse 23. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then answered Peter and said unto them, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Now, it's important to take note of what is actually communicating, what the Lord says, because of what, how people teach it, these verses. And these verses are usually taught that God would bless with riches and wealth in this life. And I, I believe the words here are quite the opposite. And Jesus said unto them, Verily, I say unto you, that ye which have followed me, now next, notice the next few words, in what? In the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall what? Sit upon the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now when he talks about in the regeneration. When the Son of Man shall sit upon the throne of his glory. Keep your place there for a moment. Get Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Verse 19. Kind of have a feeling I may have gotten ahead of myself a little bit, but that's okay. Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Repent ye therefore, 
and be converted. And where we are here in Acts chapter 3, Pentecost has come. Uh, on the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and preached, and that day 3,000 got saved. Then the next day, I think it was like 4,000 in a number that couldn't be, be numbered. But these are in, in the days after which the Holy Spirit had been poured out. Peter preaching to Israel. And so in verse 19, he says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Now notice, when? When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. It's important to note that what Peter calls over there in, uh, I believe it's 1 Peter, that prophesied grace that, was, that should come unto you, come unto the nation. That that prophesied grace that is to come unto the nation of Israel, that is when Israel come into the fullness of her blessing, the fullness of the promises that God had made to the nation of Israel. You remember Romans 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentile. He says, through, uh, trying to remember the verse now. But he talks about through their fall, the, the riches of the Gentiles and the, the, the riches, the, uh, let me look it up. Much as I quote that verse, I don't know why I forget it now. He says, now if the fall of them, this is what I'll be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them be the riches of the Gentile. He says, how much more their fullness. So one of the things is real clear about Israel's blessings, even during um, this Acts period here, their blessings were yet future. And most certainly their blessings are future from where we stand today in the dispensation of grace. Uh, Their program has been suspended. And so the fullness, the Israel coming into their fullness, coming into their salvation. And so, as, as Romans says, and so all Israel shall be saved. And with all of that, it's the fullness of, of, of the blessings that God had promised that nation. Not just, you know, I mean, all that God had promised. The riches, the wealth, the prosperity, the health, etc. Not just spiritual blessings, but material blessings for that nation will come to fruition. But even here in Acts chapter 3, we see those things are future. They were... Again, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. And he tells them exactly when, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you. You see in Acts chapter 1, the Lord Jesus Christ departed and went back into heaven. Psalm 110 verse 1 says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand to thy enemies, or make thy footstool. So the Lord is in exile. You remember Luke 19, a certain nobleman goes into a far country to receive a kingdom and for to return. And these are things that Christ taught his disciples about how he, it was expedient for him to go away that he was going to go and to receive a kingdom and to return. So the little flock had no expectation of the kingdom until the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of what? of restitution of all things. And that issue about the restitution of all things is about the restoring or the returning of that which was lost or given up. What shall we have then? We've forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have then? And it's not just a question of what they shall have, but when will they get it? 
and, the, and, and their expectation was at the second coming of Christ. Go back to uh, Matthew 19. And it, it, and it would be even uh, correct to say during the millennial reign of Christ is when they will come into those blessings during the thousand year reign. And until Christ had set up his kingdom, they, they were not given, they were not given to expect those things. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit upon his throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or fathers or mothers or wife or children or land for my name's sake shall receive, shall receive a hundredfold. And shall inherit what? Everlasting life. But again, the question is when? Now, go over to Mark chapter 10. I told you Luke 18 also, didn't I? What did I tell you? If I said 19, I meant 18. Luke 18, 29 and 30. Luke 18, verse 29 in verse 30, and this will be very similar to uh, Mark 10 in verse 30 as well. Get Mark 10 in verse 32 because I think you need, need that. To... But in verse 29, and he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake. Now get this now. Most people are telling you to, to do this, and oftentimes when they're telling you to, um, especially, uh, I'm trying to remember the, um, the Luke 6, 38 verse, when it says, Give and it shall be given to you. They, 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 they bring all of those verses together without any consideration of the doctrine. Okay, and, and the context in which those statements are often made. But they bring them all together to, to develop what I call destructive teaching about prosperity, about wealth from the Bible. And generally, when it says, give and it shall be given to you, You, you couple that again with Malachi chapter 3 about your tithing, okay? You, you, you begin to see how they, 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 they weave these verses together ultimately to teach or to instruct their listeners in giving that results in their coffers being made full. with the expectation that in doing so, God is going to give you a hundredfold in return and that they lead them to believe and to expect that return in this life. Now, the, the, the kingdom message did teach selling all giving, uh, the, the kingdom program, the tithing and all of that, and the blessings that God would, that, that was promised in doing so, for them, especially the kingdom church, not so much uh, the church in the wilderness or, or up until John, but more so with the kingdom church, that their blessing was always uh, linked to the establishment of the kingdom, which wouldn't be established until the second coming of Christ. And so the kingdom church was 
the, the, the gospel of the kingdom never taught or, or never gave that expectation that they should have been looking for. Again, as I said, that would have been contradicting the very principles or the, the, one of the central messages of the gospel of the kingdom about selling all that you have. And so their expectation about the blessings and the receipt of those blessings or, or the receiving of that, you know, receiving manifold uh, wasn't to be expected until the millennial reign. Now, these verses that we're going to look at here in a moment might seem to suggest otherwise, but I would say just be a little patient with me. I, hopefully I can make the point here about what they're actually saying. But in verse um, 30, it says, who shall, not, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life what? Everlasting. Now, look at Mark 10.30. You see, because of a prophesied event that was to follow the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, the day of the Lord, the time of Jacob's trouble. It is no wonder that the Lord instructed them to sell all that they had because of that day that was prophesied to come. John said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but there come one after me. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So the next event on the horizon following the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, according to prophecy, was the day of the Lord, the time of Jacob's trouble, a day of wrath and judgment. And Christ gave explicit instructions, explicit teaching, and explicit warnings but certainly one of the explicit teaching was to sell all that you have. And, and you can see in, all, in that teaching not to be tied down, not to have anything that would become an obstacle or a stumbling block when that day came upon the nation. Because those things would, uh, would certainly be like an anchor around their neck. That is riches and wealth and so forth. What did I tell you, Matt, uh, Mark 10, verse 30. But he, he shall receive a hundredfold. Now notice, it says, now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters. And, and so I've, I've watched and, and, and seen Word of Faith preachers use this and tell you that God has promised to give you a return on your giving that like the press down, shaking together and running, running over verse. But he said, but you shall receive a hundredfold now in this time and houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands. No, no, note the next phrase there. With what? With persecutions. And in the world to come, what? eternal life. Why did he tell them to sell all that they have? Because to try to hold, have those things and embrace those kinds of things, that would be great persecution. And, and, and again, um, during the, the time of the Antichrist, running the governmental system, and in the world today, in countries where um, dictators take over a country, what's the first thing they start acquiring? People's wealth. And if you want to hold on to that wealth, what, what generally you have to do to preserve that wealth, to preserve your status in that life? you have to compromise or you have to abandon whatever uh, values, personal values you have and adopt the ones of the dictator. And in this case, 
going against the things of God. God was not promising them wealth. Again, what was the next event on the horizon? Tribulation. Time of Jacob's trouble. And so, you know, people generally like to say, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Now, those are the kinds of verses that I think, again, they formulate what they call the Bible Wealth Code. They, they, they begin to uh, develop that, those kinds of thinking out of that. Um, again, did I quote, Seek ye first the kingdom of God? Yeah. That's one of, the, uh, one of their favorite verses. Now, time does get away so fast, and I, I knew I was going to be challenged to do this, but I'm going to press on here. Now, my message here was, again, you know, what, sh- what, what our focus should be with regards to find. Go, to, go, back, go to 1 Timothy, because this is where my text was assigned to me. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And um, just want to touch on a couple of things here. Begin, I'm going to begin at verse 1 and read down through um, verse 12. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Now, when he says these things teach and exhort, um, there's, there's an idea in verses 1 and 2. Um, and then when you couple that with verse 3, when he says, if, it, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to hold some words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine, which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strife of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railing, and evil surmising, perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds and destitute of of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such, turn away. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Therewith, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many, many hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art called, and hath professed a good profession before many witnesses. And the the long and the short of my message would be to say to you that we should disregard the prosperity teaching, the, the prosperity doctrine. We should disregard the, the pursuit of wealth as such. And fundamentally, number one is contrary to sound doctrine. It's contrary to what the, the scriptures teach us. And, and the idea set forth in 1 Timothy 6 here, uh, the pursuit there is really the pursuit of godliness. Okay. Uh, Two passages of scripture you can compare together. This one where he says there in verse uh, um, 9, but they that will be rich. And then there's a a verse over there in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. 
not 16, but verse 12, which it says, Yea, all that will what? Live godly. And, and I, 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 I saw those two things. Living godly, yea, all that will live godly shall what? Shall suffer persecution. But then here in this passage it says, um, they that will be rich fall into what? Temptation and a snare and into many foolish hurts, hurtful lusts that drown men in perdition. Now, with regards to suffering because of a person willing to live godly, the Bible teaches you to count that as all joy. That when you suffer for such. Um, that that is thankworthy. To suffer for being godly. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Well, you, you, you certainly cannot be thankworthy for the consequences of that pursuit. And you most certainly can't count it all joy for the evil, the destructiveness that pursuing uh, they that will be rich brings in life. The fundamental pursuit of, of the believer's life is that of godliness. And uh, that idea is communicating. I'm, I'm just... I'm, I'm closing right now. But let me just give you a couple of things. And these are just some verses that I, I believe summarizes what Paul is, is, is exhorting or instructing Timothy to teach here in 1 Timothy chapter 6. It was a lot, and I, I knew that coming up here, and I, I was trying to abbreviate and get, a, get, get at the heart of it. But here we go. Hebrews 13, 5, for example. Um, after look up the verses real quick and read them to you. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Okay. Um, 1 Timothy 6.19 1 Timothy 6.19 When he talks about laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Um, against the day when you have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Riches, wealth, none of that will serve you when you have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Um, Well, the preeminent concern of the believer should, be, should not be, you know, their station in life, but their walk with God. In 1 Corinthians 7, he says, Art thou called being a servant? That ties in with 1 Timothy 6. He says, Care not for it. You know, don't fill your, your mind or don't be anxious for, for, you know, overly concerned about your station in life and so forth. But the real concern that we should have, is, again, is our walk with God. That should be the principal focus. Um, being sons of God without rebuke so that we would be shining as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. And the Apostle Paul was a great example of that. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 through 21, and Philippians 4, 11 through 12 uh, would bear that out. When he says, I, I know both how to abound and I'm, I know how to suffer loss. Okay, let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this time, Heavenly Father, that we've had to look into your word. And we pray that the, the thoughts that have been expressed, set forth here, uh, would be meditated upon. 
and the things that we have clarity and understanding about, Heavenly Father, that we have that readiness and willingness to respond to it in the obedience of faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.